Live in three, two, one. Hey, everybody, I'm live. Thanks for checking out my weekly Saturday streams. Uh, here I am for another one. This is my 51st week. And uh, as some of you may know, there's only 52 weeks in a year. Um, don't double check that on me. That's I'm pretty sure that's accurate. So next week will be one full year of doing these things, I guess. And then the week after that would be January 1st, I believe, is a Saturday. And I haven't decided if I will do a stream on New Year's because sometimes these things go almost till midnight and I'd rather be with my wife and family, to be honest. Uh, not that I don't love hanging out with you guys, but I think you guys probably won't be watching my stream either on New Year's, hopefully. Uh, so I think I might I might postpone that to January 2nd on Sunday. We'll see. My original one was January 2nd, so that's more like a full circle on the days. And then maybe we'll have like a little release party or something like that. Because that was a the original plan. Uh, I'm, I'm still, you know, I might take a break. I might take a break at stream 54 or 55 or something like that. It might be time to take a break. Um, but not from the project. I'm still going to be working on it. I've still got, as you see, some post-its on the board. I'm hoping by the time I release it to have what's on the whiteboard done. But as far as the... And then the other order here is the ones on top are like after the whiteboard's done. The ones on the side are after the ones on the top. And then the ones on the bottom are last. So that's kind of how I prioritized uh, my to-do list back there, if you want to call it that. Uh, yeah, so the, what is this side project? What am I doing? What are all these post-its? These are the done ones, by the way. What I'm doing is I'm making a, a, like a fake faux web desktop, uh, desktop environment, operating system in the browser. You, there's a million names for it. Uh, you can get some contention depending on what you use. I would say people calling it an operating system or an OS that bugs people. That rubs a lot of people the wrong way. So I try to avoid that when I can. Um, but if I put the word foe in front of it, I think that's I can slip under the radar there. So let's call it that. That's what I've been working on. And you guys will see my progress today. This is live. Leave comments, please, if you want. Uh, I mean, live chat, I guess, if, if you're watching it live. If you're not watching it live, just leave comments the usual YouTube way. Uh, comments, criticisms, concerns, kudos. Uh, anything like that, I'll take it. Uh, if you like my videos, you like this video, you like me, you like liking things, then feel free to like this video as well. It it doesn't hurt. I'm always into it. And if you like me a lot or you want to follow me or you want to support me or you want to motivate me, anything like that, then feel free to subscribe. And I think there's like a bell icon thing. Feel free to click that if you're just clicking stuff at random. Um, but feel free to do none of that as well. I don't want to pressure anybody. Got my usual Powered by Red Bull here. Powered by Green Red Bull this time. Dragon Fruit. Uh, I'm already at like this part at it. So I think I started drinking this recently. Like 30 minutes ago. Uh, what else? We're at like a, wild, a wider field of vision. I think it used to be like right here my video would... All right, wait, this one goes there. And this one here. That's where it was before. And I've just increased it slightly. I think I had like a 90% zoom or something. And I decided, you know what? Let's unzoom. Let's just let everybody see the... I got my rollerblades hiding there and a desk or... Not a desk, a rack. I don't know what you'd call it. I'd, I'd fix computers there, theoretically. Although I haven't fixed computers in a while. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of at the tail end of a cold. So please excuse my nasally voice today and my possible sniffles that are incoming. Uh, and yeah... Uh, I don't know if you guys happen to see the last stream, but I feel like it's it's probably something I should mention at this point. I don't know if, if it's relevant, but I've been reading some documentation about social media recently in regards to my the company I work for now. And I've I've decided it's probably makes sense for me at the start of these videos to disclose that, uh, that I do work for Microsoft now, which is a big yay for me. I'm happy about it. Um, I probably need to do a video on it at some point in the very near future, actually. It'd be cool. Maybe it's like a 10, 15 minute little thing about it. Uh, but yeah, I figured I'd mention it because I've been working on this project as people who have seen this know before I worked at Microsoft by far. I, I didn't, at the start of this, I wasn't thinking by the, before I release this, I'll be working at Microsoft. That'd be nuts. I never had any imagination like that. But now that I do, I figure, uh, that I should probably just say, yeah, I, I work for Microsoft, but this project that I'm doing has nothing to do with them and no relation. They don't, I think they know about it. Yeah, I'm sure they know about it. I mentioned it to a bunch, a bunch of people. But it's not like, uh, there's no real connection in any relevant way. Uh, 
I'm hoping to be able to mention it to people when I release it. Like I said, in the start of the new year, everyone's kind of busy with vacations and stuff now this time of year, but it, I'm, I'm hoping it'll get a good reception because I've spent a lot of time on it. It's something I'm passionate about and hopefully people will like it, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's about it right now. V-A-W-R Tech. I got a message here from Allison Garrison. Uh, hi, Allison. I, I don't have any understanding of what you've said there as far as a message, but thanks for tuning in. If you want to clarify what you said there, uh, I'd be happy to have a discussion about it. In the interim, though, let's discuss also what <clears throat> we're going to be doing today. So we got our typical thing where we go through the branches. But one exciting thing is I've finally been able to at least partially add this app called Boxed Wine which is kind of a big deal for what I'm working on because I don't see anybody else out there that's really integrated boxed wine yet. And I've kind of got it half ish going. So I want, it's, it's going to be exciting to show it today. Uh, I'll do a quick demo of it right now, actually. Oh, it's open, opened on the wrong tab. Let me just open it on the right tab and then jump you guys over to a little sneak peekage. So this is the idea Linux emulator that runs wine. Basically they have a, a M script and WASM WebAssembly build of this that allows you in the browser to essentially run a lot of different Windows programs to the point where my app here, this is my app, and I'm uh, pretending to look like Windows 10, basically. How it's going to be, how I've set it up now, is you could literally take an executable file from your computer, drop it onto my thing, double click it, and it'll open in the web, in the browser, an ex a .exe. And it's, uh, it works, actually, in a lot of cases. Not in every single case, but you can see they've got some cool examples here. And these are just examples at random, but I've been able to get a lot of stuff running on it that wasn't, uh, that's not on here, like Notepad++, uh, Virtual Dub, uh, what else? Or er Earthen View, uh, random stuff, but just just all sorts of different stuff. Uh, Heroes of Might and, Might and Magic 2, that was a cool one because I wanted to, that was a game me and my, my friend used to play all the time. And I thought I'd be able to do that with the DOS emulator. We actually had a DOS version. We played it on DOS, but I can't find the DOS version as a shareware version that works properly within JS DOS, which is using DOSBox. Um, but it, it actually does work with uh, with boxed wine. So we'll, we'll check that out later. I have like, uh, where is it here? Heroes H2 demo. I'll just drop it on here. The, it won't work right now. Like if we right click now, open with, all there is is the DOS one. So if I try to open the H2 demo in DOS here, it will not function. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's possible there might be something broken that we fixed. It really hates that zip file. That's intriguing though. I feel like I tried this before and it worked totally fine. So it's possible that something later in this episode we fix in regards to JS DOS being currently broken, I guess. Hmm. It's possible that it actually hates that zip. Some of the zips it doesn't like. But Boxed Wine actually played that zip just fine. So that's another interesting little piece. Let me try to find another example. Well, let's just say we open it here, H2 demo. We open the zip file and we look inside here. It's It's got an EXE. I'm gonna add an, uh, the icon for executables. In the far future, what I really want is to be able to extract the icon from the EXE and show that icon. And I've had a proof of concept that partially got me the way there, but it's surprisingly difficult. Like there is, ex there is a clear way how to do it, but no one's really done it properly in JavaScript, so I'm kind of having to kludge stuff together. But anyways, right now, here's the exe. I double-click it, nothing happens. I wonder if I should actually have something happen when people double-click files that have nothing to open with. Because you can, what you can do is you can right-click, and I can open anything with Monaco. It's going to look like binary gibberish. But yeah, I almost should have like a notification. Let me make a note of that for the next stream. Um some kind of dialogue for when <clears throat> double double clicking a file that can't be opened I guess yeah I really hadn't even considered that honestly it's funny what what you overlook and you get like QA or you just get somebody else looking at it that's why it'll be exciting what kind of bugs people find I mean I'm not looking forward to people finding like browser bugs because I've pretty much exclusively developed in Chrome. I have gone to Firefox a bit and in this episode we'll take a look at some of the fixes I've been doing for Firefox. <clears throat> but but yeah, in general I'm I'm expecting people are going to have issues with Safari, tons of issues with mobile, I bet. I'm going to do more cross-browser testing before I release it, but I just guarantee people are going to have problems. Uh 
anyways, this thing does a lot. I mean, if you guys want to throw something in the chat, throw me a request for something it should do. I mean, if you if you know about it, you, you could easily just, like, make me fail. But there's a lot of things it can do anyways. Like, let's, uh, for example, let's look at the program files folder. And you can just kind of see all the... Pro it's already kind of adding up here. Like, here's some of the programs I got now. 12 of them. And I've actually got more than that. These are just the ones that required libraries to run. But I have other things. Although 12 might be the main the reasonably big number. Like, these are just different games running on the same program. Although Space Cadet is a different program. Those emulators are all different programs. Uh, what else? I've recently been adding pictures. The pictures I add are, are my actual personal pictures. So this actually is not stuff I, I post into the repository. But I do have a lot of personal pictures here that I've decided will be cool. I'm going to have to, before I release it, I need to fix the icon cache. And also make these pictures smaller. Because as it is now, if somebody goes to the wrong folder, you could end up downloading like 20 megabytes of pictures just to look at some thumbnails or something. Uh, yeah, as you can see, I've got quite a, a travel history. I've actually got, these are just the countries that I actually took photos of me, of me in. There were other countries I had pictures of that were, that I'm just not in, but I've actually been to 50 countries. So it would have been cool to have 50 folders here, but I only have 38 where I could find pictures of myself. If anyone wants to see any pictures from any of these folders, I can, uh, take a peek as well. But otherwise we can move on from that. Uh, I think in fact, it's probably time we get to the actual looking into the commits and doing them, you know? So let's do that. First one, safer canceling of map directory. Alrighty, let's check it out. What is it here? I feel like I did this. Did I not do this? Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, I did it, but I feel like I did this episodes ago. What is the issue here? So if we <clears throat> go to map directory and I press cancel, ah, yes, it does not like that. The user aborted a request. That sounds harsh. Let's, let's be, I don't want to say, no, I'm not even going to make that joke. Let's fix the problem here. Let's just fix it. Uh, okay. So we're going to overwrite handle basically with that other code. Now it looks like this. If we look at the diff, we can kind of see the gist of it. After this, uh, wakes up here, my code actions are booting up. You can't really see it because the pop-ups happening under my picture. There we go. Now it's done. Change, check the diff. So yeah, this line stayed how it was before. I basically just wrapped this in a try catch that I let fail because otherwise this would throw an error and I don't care about the error. It's just the person saying that they changed their mind, which is fine with me. And it's one of those things that QA would test for easily, but it's not something necessarily that would come to my mind. I mean, now it would, but you got to run into these things before you remember them almost. I guess I could make a list of all these little wonkiness things. What's next? Use process context as base context. Plus fix add file. Oh, okay. Why plus? Oh, was this it? Oh, I guess it's just saying this fixes it. I did this and I probably prefer it this way. And also it happened to fix this. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes you have to watch out for this. And this was a sneaky bug actually was that one of my components was in a different context or was using a different context, but it was out of, was in the wrong order. So in one section it would have data and another section it was empty and if you don't recognize that, that what, what's going on is like, oh yeah, of course, then it can be a little bit like, wait, what's going on? And it took me, it, it got to the point where that that's where I always kind of lean on my debugging and uh, troubleshooting skills is that you can almost trace any problem with a computer. If you just like hit your head at it, like line by line almost, or, or, I mean, to save yourself some time, just try to pick some logical points where like, okay, visually I see it here. So let's work backwards from this visual, you know, how, what makes this appear? And then, well, why did that, why did that appear? Well, why did it get in the state where that appeared? And then just back, back, back. And eventually you get to the thing where it's like, oh, here it was okay. Now let me go back a little bit. And then you're like, oh, okay. Something's going on here. And then just dump a million console logs in there perhaps. Uh, or there's, there's more advanced ways with debuggers and breakpoints and stuff, but I'm somehow a fan still of console logging when it doesn't just blow up your screen. And when you can see like six or seven things, and you're just like, okay, yeah, okay. I've heard some of the new React Dev tools are going to have more of a timeline. I'm really into that approach that 
I haven't seen much in browsers yet or in general in the tools. There's a few tools out there like that, but if they could get that in React Dev Tools where like a render timeline, so you can just do stuff and then you've got this timeline, you can kind of go back and forward and see how it was because trying to parse it backwards or log things or even breakpoints, you're like, oh, now I'm here, but wait, where was, what was back there again? And then, okay, what was up here? But if you just got this timeline, you can kind of scrub through almost about what, about states, then, you know, I'm all for it. So what did I do? I copied the new file because I just want to change this one thing. We're going to open it in an app here and I'm just going to overwrite it and see that it actually did the change. Looks like it did. Double check on the diff. Yeah. So the basics of this was taking the process provider and moving it up to the top. So the processes, so any of these things can access things about the processes. And I'm not sure if logically that makes more sense. It's almost like evolved into this order. Like I think I had it in a different order. And then just through making certain component interactions, I realized what had to move up. And I think that might be an okay approach. I'm not sure. I mean, I guess the other approach would be just to have it all figured out ahead of time, but that is not what this project is. <clears throat> I've got I've got it all figured out in that I've I know what Windows 10 does and what it looks like. And that was like I'm just gonna take my home experience when I sit on my computer, I have my pictures folder, I have all my you, you know, that was the original conception of this was that it wasn't about copying Windows 10 or anything like that. It was like I want my personal website to be like if someone just sat down on my computer and open my folders because I have it all there, you know. I've got my blog posts in my documents folder. Uh, I've got my pictures in there, you know. I've got my apps and my games that I, I like to play or that I liked to play when I was a kid. Some of those I have. And that was the experience I just wanted to put on, on my personal website. So that when someone goes to my website, it's not like, oh, this is such a great recreation of Windows 10. It's like, this is what it's like to sit at Dustin's computer and be like peeking through his full files and stuff. But really, my files are all set up for you to look at. And I'm I'm an open book, you know. So that's that's that was the idea, but at the same time I realized like to get it right, I mean how how where's the limit? There is no limit, you know. The limit the limit is the point where it is it feels exactly the same or in some way superior, I guess. At that point I, I'm okay, but I I'm, I mean after a year when I release this in a few weeks, it is not going to be in that stage. When all these post-its are done, it still will not be in that stage. Maybe when these post-its are done, plus I fill an entire wall of polish then maybe I can say, okay, I've got something that's that could compete. I mean, mm, at no point would I want to compete, and at no point could I compete with what I've got because it's it's just not the same thing. It's not an operating system. It's not something someone would go into to do things right now. Maybe in 20 years from now it could be, you know, when the performance is there because these emulators could be cool. There's things that could be connected together. If more things had networking, if there was more interconnectivity, I mean, maybe you could say, take this, take my tool and actually put it back on the desktop as like a Electron app. And then it could be some kind of useful, like file uh, manipulator tool, you know, where you just, you can put dump files in there and do stuff with them in this little sandbox almost. Like you could think of it as like some kind of sandbox. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's open for ideas. I'm hoping when I get out there and people see it, that maybe someone else comes up with an idea <clears throat> and wants to run with it and free for them to do it, you know? On that note, I'm thinking of switching licenses. I'm not sure about this MIT license versus, uh, what was the other one? There was another one that interested me, whatever the other one was. Let's take a peek. Let's see here, get license options. I don't know. GNU, which one was it? Licensing a repository. Where's the MIT one? <laughs> okay, what are the other ones? Here we go, so there was MIT. There was some other one I was considering it. I'm not seeing it here yet. Maybe it was the GNU one, but I don't think it was. Was it the Apache one? Hmm. What was it? What if we just say like, oops. What if we say best get licenses? What's the best? Well, I'm using the MIT one. It says that's a percentage of projects. Yeah, maybe then. I think well, there was some reasoning where I was like, I didn't feel the MIT one was even open enough. Choose an open source license. I want it simple and permissive. Well, that's the MIT one. I care about sharing improvements. Also lets people do almost anything they want, except distributing closed source versions. Maybe that was what I liked. 
was that I didn't like the idea that my project would become a closed source project. But at the same time, I mean, I'm, I don't even like the idea of closed source in that way. In that, like, if you're making improvements, it's like, I, I love them, but I don't know. I guess they've paid for the work. Huh, that's a tough one. Maybe the MIT one's more fair. Allow, uh, what does this say here? It lets people do almost anything they want with your project, like making and distributing closed source. Well, that's more open, I guess. Or more, it's not more open, it's more free. It's really saying, hey, just do whatever. Maybe that's what I want the most, because I want to be the most hands-off with it, you know? I, I wouldn't want, if someone tries using it closed source, I'm not going to go after you. I don't care. So maybe in that way, yeah. Yeah, I want it simple and permissive. Okay. Let's stick with MIT license then. I just convinced myself out of switching there. All right, what have we done here? We did this. Let's move on. Next, don't double load JS DOS images. Good advice. Hey, maybe this is related to that other thing not working. Who knows? Let's start making patches because I'm too lazy to even fix that that way. So now I'm going to start making patches with the GitHub uh, patch functionality. That's that's a little move I like to, to do. Get apply. Drag this in here. Run it. Boom. Just like that. Type my commit message and then we diff it up together here. Let's take a peek. So what have I done here? What was the difference? What was the diff? Rinse. Uh, get it? I, I'm a father, so I'm allowed to do dad jokes, by the way, in case you're wondering. Okay, that's actually the best part of being a father is you can finally do the dad jokes. So I was, before I had read file, I don't know why I was checking read file. That was a waste of time, so I don't do that anymore. And the other thing here was this, yes. This was the issue, I think, is this would be undefined. The bundle would load and something else would trigger this effect before it got to the end of that function, which was when it got defined. Yes, that is correct. So what I've done is I've said it could, it can be undefined, but it has to be in that object, the DOS CI object. So then it, it stops checking for if it's undefined and it just checks if it exists in the object. And then I set it as undefined to start. So basically this won't run twice now. So this will get, the effect gets triggered again, but this now, now sees that it's in there still undefined. And then it uh, continues on. And I can't think of a better way to do that at the moment, but Simple enough, the logic of it. That just stops it from double loading. Because I don't like double loading. That's the solutions you kind of come up with with React. I think typically when, when you don't want to remove things from the dependency array. Because you can remove things from dependency arrays. And then sometimes it can make sense in your mind. That it's like, I don't care if this changes. But it does mean you have a stale version of it typically. And, and that's something you should care about typ typically. Even if you don't think you should. The more you know. I could be wrong on that too, so don't quote me. What's next? I think I did the same for something else. Only set up JSDOS event once. That sounds like a good idea. What did I do here? I moved the loading thing to a different place. Only set up JS. How did that make it go once? Okay, so only when it's loading does this occur. Before this was occurring all the time. Yes, this was causing some wonky resizes actually. So sometimes it's confusing from the commit message because the commit message says what I've done. It doesn't say why I did it. Only set up JS DOS events once. Okay, well, it was only supposed to run once is what you're saying. And, and, it's, and it was running twice and that, and that was causing some issue, you know? That's the problem with commit messages. That's what I try to get through in PR sometimes. It's like, try to, try to, teach, try to explain it to me like I'm dumb, you know? I'm gonna play dumb all the time. So that you explain stuff in a good way. Play dumb, be dumb, what's the difference? So now the loading thing happens, right, just this once. Yeah, why was this ever triggering twice? This was silly. Much more efficient this way. I think this episode's kind of filled with bug fixes and then me doing like a ton of boxed wine stuff. And I might end up just merging some of the boxed wine stuff together. We'll see. We shall see. Fixed local echo tab display. Oh, yeah, I was happy about this. I don't think I'm going to be able to describe how I fixed it. This is a lib update. Um, I went into the lib source code and fixed it. The end, basically. What was the issue? 
Um, it was like a off by one error type of thing. If there was only one line of com of uh, possible completions to display, it would display none. If there were two lines, it would display one. Um, I'm not sure if it's because of something I messed up in the code or if that lib is literally just doing that. Anyways, I'm just going to overwrite it here. I'm doing this in the background. I downloaded the binary and I just copied it. There it is there. So the lib has changed. You can see right here, I changed this dash, 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 quote, bracket to a bracket, dash, quote, dash, 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 quote, and symbol. And now it's a lot faster. So that's how you do it. I, any questions? I would assume not. It's pretty simple. So, anyways, fix local echo tab display. Next, next, what the hell did I do? Fix type check for DOS CI. That sounds like something I do. Let's see here. Uh, uh, let's look at the diff. Sometimes the diffs are a little bit better. Like the, the just the comparison tool itself, the way it colors things. It is something I prefer. Oh, the colors. Ugh. Just all the purples and... Well, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll just show you. I'll just show you. Come on. So here it is here. Yeah, what were the color differences here? Well, there is purple here, but yeah, it's not really relevant. So in the end, what did I do? This before was just writing the file. Now, first I check that there is a bundle before I try to write it. That seems reasonable. Why would this ever not occur, I wonder, though? What was my reasoning? Fix type check for DOS CI. Okay, oh, right, this is because of that previous fix I did where I allow it to be undefined. Where is that? Here. So I've set up so that, okay, it can start undefined, but then if somehow closed bundle gets triggered, don't try to save the bundle because there never was a bundle yet. Yes. So don't run the persist command, which should have been in the bundle, had it existed. Typically, in the past, I was just assuming this file was like that. So this is one of those typical cases where I broke it and then fixed it. Uh, which one was it? It was this one here. I'm going to call that a follow-up commit instead of making it on the same line. I added the problem, and then I fixed the problem. So these two things combined basically fix one problem. I think one thing that's been helpful with this tool is that it's so easy to use a lot of the code. Like, if you just open a few things and minimize, maximize, you know, a couple clicks, and you've ran like, I don't know, 60% of the code that isn't apps, just because there's so much interaction that if you make mistakes, you do run into them pretty quick. Uh, I don't I don't know if that's, a, if that's a good thing. It doesn't sound like a good thing. Okay, what was next? Uh, I just did this one. So remove prepended new line on CLS. Yes, this is something that was bug bugging me, actually. <laughs> of course, with this wacky terminal. So I reset it, and you get two new lines at the start. And by writing code, by writing additional things, you actually remove a line. That's the wonkiness of, uh, of writing of this terminal app. But anyways, I can't even remember what the heck this is. I think this is like delete first line or something. I don't know. But it works anyway. So the first thing I do is reset. Reset actually did exactly what I want. It clears everything, puts the prompt back at the top. But for some reason, it was creating two new lines at the start. And the real command prompt, I don't know why I'm doing real in quote, the real command prompt was only doing one new line. So by doing this, I delete the first line after I clear the screen. And then it looks like there's only one new line. Other than that, I typically use the local echo library to do most of the terminal writing, but I, I like the way that terminal reset kind of takes the bull by the horns and says, you're clear now. So back to reality. Oh, disable controls with no PDF pages. Yeah, that's reasonable. There's a few PDF fixes I do today, actually. So this, this is worthy of a patch file, I guess. Anytime there's like three or four line changes, I'm like, okay, let's let's just patch that. I can't believe at the start of this, like when I did episodes one to thirty, I didn't even use the commits or patches. I would just look at a massive diff diff file that maybe had fifty commits, and I would just go line by line and try to apply all the changes. And I don't know how I did it, honestly. I'm a little surprised. 
I'm not sure what changed that allowed me to keep pace. I feel like I get the same amount done, actually. Like, with doing these commits, it still takes me two or three hours. I don't know. Maybe we do more now. Hopefully. Hopefully that's the case. So here it is. Disable controls with no PDF pages. So there, I already had this count variable for how many pages there are. If it's not zero, then we show the pages in their count. And the zoom out and zoom in buttons are disabled if there's no count, if count is zero. I should just say count is zero, actually. I prefer that. I like to be very explicit with these things because you could say shorthand is like no count, but now you're saying if it's undefined, I mean, I guess if it's undefined, you literally, you would not want that, but why would, it should never get in an undefined state because right here I default to zero. So if this was undefined here, it would default to zero. So if, yeah, I don't know. Would you rather have an unexpected result to try to figure out why count was undefined? It's debatable. Anyways, I've decided to be more explicit with it. And I've definitely been explicit in explaining it. Too much so. Maybe all my commits should just link to these YouTube conversations instead. Instead of actually typing the text. Probably a bad idea. It's actually something I gotta do. I gotta back up all these videos at some point. They're pretty much just on YouTube. So if YouTube decided to like knock out my channel, it's like, well, there's a year of videos gone. At least my code survives, but the videos would be fun to have too, so. I need to download those. Hopefully they would just let you download them, but I could see them not doing that. What's next? Did I commit that disable thing? Yeah, I did. How many? It says I've done eight here. Let's double check that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, that checks out. What next? Slightly smaller start menu. Oh, that's a wild one. Yeah, how did this come about? I found out that if you set a certain thing in Windows 10 taskbar settings, you can actually remove the app list and tile button and essentially combine them. And then if you remove all the tiles, you can actually make the menu smaller than if you had the two views and you were just in the list view. So long story short, I found out the list view in Windows 10 can look smaller and I prefer that view. So I've essentially decided that that would be a view that I will support as authentic. And I'm going to change my view from that. So instead of 350 pixels, I now do 320. And it's going to make such a huge difference that as soon as you see it, you're going to say, oh, wow, that's so much better. Can you see? Whoa, what a difference, hey? I'm, of course, being sarcastic because uh, I'm not even sure I applied the change there. I think I did. But the change was subtle. Subtle. That's how I like my changes. Okay, another one committed, and we move on. Square the refresh button. Ah, yes. Too rectangular for my taste. Much too rectangular. Actually, on a more serious note, I'll show you the reasoning behind it. Uh, so let's say we open a folder here. And this is the button here. If I would shrink the window to as small as I allow, it actually cuts off the little dude's side. And if I... If by making this refresh button more square than rectangular, it actually fixes the problem. So I've decided that I'm just going to consider it a design choice rather than a, a fix, almost. So here it is here, I think, the navigation. Let's double check that. Yes, the styled navigation. And it was already height of 28, so I'm just going to make it an actual square and make it 28 by 28. And visually, it doesn't make much of a difference. It looks a tiny bit more square there. The, the Windows one is a little more rectangular. But they do something different with the icon. I think they can go smaller with their windows. I don't remember. But I decided this was more nice. So this is as small as it gets. And it basically doesn't cut off any of the icons. And at the same time, you get a square button, which you could argue looks okay. Square is a reasonable shape. So I'm happy with it. It's not a squished square. That would be embarrassing. All right, committed. Commit it and move on. Go to line for Monaco. Oh yeah, this was a nice little touch that I figured out how to do. Um, I played around with this a lot before I figured out how easy it was. It was interesting, it was two commands. So when I click, basically what it is is I, let's go to Monaco for a second here. 
Where the heck is it? Do I have anything I can open in Monaco? This. So this read me here. So you see this button here, this line one, coal one. This actually wasn't a button. These other things aren't buttons. You can't do anything clicking that, can't do that. And this one doesn't do anything right now either. But in Monaco, in the in the code editor, my real code editor, this button, if you click that button, this appears. Now, because this is based on Monaco, VS Code, I actually have this exact same box I can make appear, but I wasn't utilizing it, and now I want to. So now what I have is when you click on that text, it also has a, an alt tag now that says go to line column. And when you click it, there's li there's actually, you can just do, do editor get action, editor.action.gotoline.run, and it pops that up. So it took me a heck of a long time to find that exact code. A lot of trial and error. This is why I pre-baked this thing. If, if like if I had to do that functionality for this stream, it probably took me two hours to figure out how to do it in that clean way. Before I was doing all sorts of mess to try to make it work. And in the end, it's like, oh, there's a built-in feature. It's got a built-in action. You just there's a run command for an action. Uh, when I do just the run command, it says it's not focused because when I click on the status bar, it actually unfocuses for Monaco because my little thing is not is fake Monaco. So the click occurs, then the refocus occurs, then the get action shows. We'll see it in action here. So now when I click on it, boom, there we go. Just like the one in uh, Mon in VS Code, and it works the same. What is? It? I don't know how this one works. I don't know how it works. I don't. I don't use this. But what do I do? Forty five. There we go. And it goes to line forty five. Enter. Cool. So someone could use that now to go to the lines or whatever the heck they want to do. And it makes my little fake editor feel more like VS Code, I guess, or something. Uh, I almost want to call this like Notepad. Plus, you know, like there's Notepad Plus Plus, and that one's probably better. We're actually going to run Notepad Plus Plus in our app today, by the way. Just a little uh, name drop there. So let's commit that. That was a cool one. What else we got? Next up, scroll bar effect in start. Oh, so here's where I did a few Firefox tweaks, I think. Scroll bar effect in start menu. Uh, yes, yeah, so Firefox had different selectors. Firefox actually has this CSS selector called scroll bar width that actually the other browsers don't support, but most the MDN makes sure to point out, oh, this is the spec and Chrome is the is the wild man. And the other browsers are the wild man. We're following the spec. So whatever. So this is apparently a spec, reasonably specced. Basically, in Chrome I can make the pick it can make the scroll bar any size I want using this. But in Firefox it just completely ignores that. So the best I can do is thin or auto. And it gets the same effect, basically. I actually don't have Firefox to show. At some point, we'll go through Firefox, maybe during the release party. Suffice to say, this is just some basic additional stuff. Uh, this was another field that they support called scroll bar color. It, for some reason, it was already dark for me. I don't know why. But uh, maybe because my visual is set for dark. But I made it explicit here that I want the scroll bar to look dark because in... The WebKit selectors, I'm actually specifying a dark color already, which happens to match the OS, so win-win. Anyways, long story long. Oops. I'm going to copy the message here, like so. Oh, I'm going to resize the window and mess up my share. Then I have to resize it again. It's so finicky, the resizing. There we go. All right, where was I? Back to the code. Git apply, Hit commit, like so. And like I said, I just added more features because this was being ignored, this pixel size, this width on the scroll bar. Firefox doesn't care about that. The best I can do is thin. And what is this for? Ah, and also it, there's a none as an option too to basically hide it. And that's actually what I wanted here. And that's what I was doing here. I had zero. And then here was just setting the color dark just because here I, I also have a dark color. So that's my attempt to get Firefox support for some of the scroll bar visuals that I've tried to make happen in, in the start menu, which I think the connoisseur of CSS might appreciate. That's actually a big part of what I'm hoping with this project when people see it that ha have done CSS and JavaScript before and they're like, oh, how, how did he do that, you know? I hope that people will want to dig into the code because there's some stuff I did there that's tricky. It's it's rare, but there's a few things like that. 
What next? Fix Monaco reading WHTML language. Okay, this seems simple enough. Ah, yes. So I made this custom extensions thing, but then I messed up how the extensions have to be formatted. Boo, Dustin. Here we go. So even here I had the dot, and then I somehow expected the dot wouldn't be needed there. Come on. Come on. But you know what it might have been? It might have then been before I was returning for the language detector, but now I'm returning for my own custom mapping. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. Anyways, this works now. I don't recall if it worked before. That's all that matters. Don't recall, don't care. Don't allow moving mounted folders. Yes, that's good. Good idea. This is all it took. Uh, again, I needed to access the old mount map. This is part of the root FS that comes from browser FS. It basically tells me what is mounted in my mountable file system because I'm using the mountable file system backend from browser FS. So these two conditions were already occurring here. Basically, I just checked the mount map as well. So if it's part of the mounted, wait, what is this function? This is for creating a path, right? So create path happens for, for moves as well. It's like a rename basically. And this stops it that from occurring now if it's a mounted file, mounted uh, folder, which is very reasonable actually. Um, I can probably just do this as one little command here. Assuming this was all the same, let me double check. Yeah, that was the same. Yeah, nothing else changed. Okay, let's go find this code and I'll just add that condition. And one nice thing about the way I have the prettier setup is you can kind of be sloppy. So let's say here, so I copied that little piece and I want it at the end of the condition here. I just paste in what I had. Okay, that looks ugly, right? But I have prettier. So all I do is say control S and it just cleans it up for me. Thank you, prettier. All those little things make it a little nicer to code and a little more clean and it's just less cognitive load. I don't ever reorganize tabs anymore, indenting or any of that crap. So this was the don't allow moving mounted folders. Yes. Very good idea. Indeed. If I do say so myself, fix progress bar color for Chrome. Yes. Somehow while fixing it for Firefox, I broke it for Chrome. I think the issue was, what was the issue here? What was the issue? This, oh right, this used to be part of, these selectors were combined and for some odd reason they needed to be separated. The diff is, is turning my eyes wonky. So I'm just gonna, even though it's such a simple one, I'm gonna use a patch because um, I don't wanna have to use any cognitive Ability is to try to figure out what was supposed to move move where. Yeah, here it looks more clear. Oh yeah, so before this was a comma and this was all combined. And now I kind of split this out. And for some reason that made a difference. The combined selector basically got ignored because it had like a Firefox piece to it, I guess, or something. I'm not even sure if that's that's true, but it was not applying the color properly for Chrome. And it was before, so I was like, what's up? Don't make zip if it wasn't created. Sounds sensible. So what is this? This is for downloading, I think. Ah, uh, yes. If you try to download a bunch of stuff that is filtered out and you get to this stage and it failed and this was empty, don't get to the point where you trigger the download for the user. I don't know even what creates that situation. I don't remember how to recreate that. But at the same time, I completely agree with it. So let's just apply it. It's almost like a one-liner, honestly. Two-liner. How many lines is it? How many liners is it? Let's see here. Oh, is it, yeah, basically, it's like one condition. I could have made it a one-liner almost, but it would have been sloppy. Oh, wait, there's something else I changed down here. Same idea. So for archiving, for creating this, yeah, basically in the two scenarios where I create zips, I was just, I was ignoring, I, I still ignore the error. But if you don't give me a zip file, I, I, st I don't try to do something with it. Before I was, yeah, before I was making folders and creating links and all sorts of jibbery jap. Now I'm a little more picky. Did, did you give me a zip file to work with? Oh, okay, then I'll do something. Nice. So now we're onto the boxed wine part. And I almost want to apply a lot of these at once. Like, what do we got here? Don't update file info if closed. Was that a boxed wine thing? No. Maybe we skip boxed wine till the end. 
Because I... Do we want to? No, let's not. Let's do it in chunks, though. What we'll do is this one first. This is this is a boxed wine chunk. And then I do a little rando one. And then we're back to boxed wine again. Oh, no. There's so much boxed wine here. I think we should just put it all together. Yeah, let's try to put it all together. Let's tell you what we'll do. We're going to make sure we got all my commits cleared. My desktop's clear. And I'm going to save all the commits that are boxed wine related. We're going to count them. Like uh, like the count. So these ones for sure. So we're going to get these five. Now I'm going to mess up the order. That's going to frustrate me. That's a problem that happens with Windows. I have to make patches for all of these because there's like a bunch of files here, actually. This one will be probably one of the biggest patches because this has all the WASM files. This has a 14 megabyte zip file that I only need once. Hopefully this patch works. I've never tried to patch with a 14 megabyte zip file. Maybe they've improved it since, actually, too. While we're at it, let's go to the boxed wine thing, actually. I wanted to mention and call out these cool guys that uh, helped me out. So if you see here in closed issues, I actually asked them to make me a, a build because I, I just I couldn't figure it out. And then they did. They set up a whole build pipeline for me here. And let's see. I was on build 7. Oh, they're on build 12 now. Jeebs. Hmm. I wonder what they fixed. Well, you know, I've already changed a bunch of stuff, so let's just, let's not mess with it for now. Maybe I'll upgrade later. But if the patch works, I'm just going to leave it be. Let's let's see if this patch works. So this is a big file. I got to save this download here. It's like uh it's done anyways cuz I got fast internet. There's our first patch. That was a huge one. Let's close this and get the next one. I think they're progressively much smaller. This one seems to be big too, actually, though, being honest. Oh, too big. How is that one bigger than the other one? What happened? I just like move everything? What happened here? That doesn't make sense to me. How's that bigger than the first one? Oh, did I? Wait, what did I? Ah, uh, yes, I, I moved away from the, using this boxed wine one and I moved to the bigger one, even bigger. <laughs> But it looks like it's not going to allow that, which is giving me a bit of a headache. That's frustrating. What was it saying here? Let's try this one more time. Too big. Or it took too long to generate. Which is it? Okay, well, that gives me... That's frustrating. I wonder where that puts us here. Well, I think I can download the file separately to start with. You know what I'm thinking of doing here? Rather than all this silly commitness, we're gonna go into the the branch itself, and we're just gonna take out what we need. We're gonna we're gonna build boxed wine from from the collective. But in that case, so what I'm thinking is I'm thinking we go into files changed, and I'll just get like like this is boxed wine, this is boxed wine. These are the ones where I've already done all the things, and then we'll kind of go through and I'll explain what I've done. And then we'll just be one big boxed wine commit. That I like. So until we do that, I, I'd like to finish the other ones first then. So let's do that first. We'll get to boxed wine last. So these ones we're skipping for now. What's this one? Don't update file info if closed. Yes, this was causing a bug, I think. What was the scenario where this would cause a bug? Ah, uh, yes, if like you open a folder... And then it starts to generate a little thumbnail for, let's say, a large file. And you close that folder before it's done generating the thumbnail. The function was already prepared to set that image, but you've gotten rid of the image. And that was causing an issue. So now I just uh, I have a little thing that checks if it's visible. And if it's not visible, invisible, what's the logic behind visible? I'm trying to remember. Let's take a peek. I think it's just a ref, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I added ref here. I added a ref called visible. I moved the update info function. Where was it before? I guess I made up that function. Oh yeah, before it was just doing set info no matter what. And I was, right, I was passing set info directly to this function and to this one. And now I pass update info instead. And when this effect, when this use file info hook is no longer needed and it causes the destroy event, I set the ref to false. 
so that if either of these functions are in the middle of setting an image, that they will now see the when they run the function, the ref will go, oh, this is this is not visible anymore, and it won't update the info that it got. So that's the basics of it. Sometimes I use that. I'm actually trying to use. I'm actually starting to feel like using more refs. I, I've started to get the flow for them a little bit, and they're pretty handy. Pretty pretty handy. So we did that one. Uh, this is another boxed wine. Boxed wine. This was boxed wine. Generic base args. I don't think this is. What is this? What is this? This is me messing with the types. Uh, but why? But why? Is this related to something involving boxed wine? I don't think so. I think there was two parts to this, though. I think I broke something. I broke the pipeline by doing this. This is boxed wine. The don't throw again. All the don't throws were. Detect loaded. It's more boxed wine junk. Okay. Update title and fix cursor. Oh man, it's all boxed wine. Everything's boxed wine. Good. So we're still trying to figure out if these types need fixing. I think they do. Is it this here? Linting and build fixes. Yeah. Not that one. This one here. This was a mistake. I should have left icon and title there. Let's do that then. So we will do that patch where we kind of tweak the types a little bit. Because I like the basic idea of it. And I'll explain it here. The whole story started back in 1983. No, I'm just kidding. What did I do here? So I took a bunch of these types out of the generic process, and I basically call them base process arguments that can be changed by the arg command. But two exceptions to that are icon here, which can stay where it was, and URL, was it URL? No, title. Both of those already had functions to update them anyways. Whereas these other functions did not. This was just me because I, I earlier I created a function called argument that you could I was using to change certain things. I think URL might be another one that could have been here. I'm not sure why it needed to be here. I think URL can also be changed by argument. Although, no, I have a function for that. I almost wonder, yeah, if this could be over here. Doesn't need to be. Let's leave it there. But basically, yeah, these other function, these other variable booleans mostly could be changed uh, by the argument command. So I thought it was okay to just put that there. Generic base args for process. Just kind of tweaking my type definitions there. Nothing fancy. So that was also dealt with here. That was this piece. This we could do quick. Um, this was when I added scroll bar width. I guess I messed up style and. Stylent wanted that a, a little bit different positioned. Where did it want that? Below padding, okay. Alphabetically speaking, I guess. Elemental P, Q, or S, yeah. So let's say Stylent fix. Very minor and simple one, but keep our linters happy. I, I think I don't have a, I think Stylent just sucks at Wait, why did that get past my silent scans? Hmm, let's add it to our next uh, stream follow-up. Is lint stage missing style lint? Question mark? Not going to dig into it today, but it feels like it is. Something's up there anyways. So we did that one now. That was this. I think most of these... This one maybe also is something I can fix, but the rest of these were boxed wine, we decided. Generic based, yeah, that was the types that we just did. Don't otherwise these were all boxed wine. This one I don't think is boxed wine, which I just opened. Yeah, this one was nice that I fixed. Basically, the truncated version had a little bit better word wrap style that I prefer to the non-truncated version in the way that it would break certain lines based on the math that it would do. And when when the icon text doesn't need the ellipsis, like dot, 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 for the extension, when it can fit on two lines, if you'd focused it, it would, and it's the only focused item, it was switching from the truncated version to the non-truncated version, even if truncation wasn't needed. But the line breaking would, would switch, which would be a little jarring. 
So this basically, if it's the only focused item, we will switch, but only if it doesn't also have the same length of name. And the, the logic behind that is, if there's no dot dot dot, then the text content will be the same, and the line breaking gets ignored. But I want the line breaking of the truncate name, because that's how it looks before you focus on it. And I don't want that jarring changing of the line breaking visual. So pretty subtle, but that's the kind of, that's what we get to here. And that's actually something that gets missed a lot on big websites, is that that last little mini polish where I run into that on, you know, Facebook, not so much in Google, actually, to be honest, they, they polish it as much as they can. But the Facebook app, I find stuff that I run into all the time that's like that. I mean, let's say for Gmail, I've, I've seen that before with some of the sidebar stuff where it's a bit wonky. But the Google search engine, I think that they've polished that one to the hilt or whatever as much as possible. I've, I've never seen a... I haven't seen much wonkiness on the Google search results, honestly. Oops, this is in the wrong spot. That should be down here. There we go. Was style and fix the last thing I did? Yeah, I guess it was. And now we're doing that truncated text thing with the better line breaking. So yeah, I did the linting styling. Uh, this is a Monaco thing, I think. What is that? Move shadow root instead of styling it. Yes. Wait. Didn't I do this today? Huh. It makes it sound like I did this yesterday, but I'm pretty sure I did that today. That's weird in the commit history. 10 hours ago. Yeah, that's today, like in the afternoon. But the 18th... It is the 18th. Why do I have commits from the 19th then? I guess that's just the time zones for GitHub. It's confusing me. Anywho. What did I do here? I actually discovered a bug when I did this. This is a lot better the way I've done the codes. Before, long story short, let's open Monaco. So the issue here, when I right-click with Monaco, you see here how it's it's cutting off that menu. And that's because this shadow root DOM element is inside something that I couldn't break it out of. I couldn't figure out the way out of it. But what I found out is that I already was triggering on blur to do this fix for the submenus where they were like showing up behind. But rather than even doing this wonky st adding of styling and then checking for the styling, the better approach was just to move it one time. Basically, the Shadow DOM appears the first time you right-click, I think. Maybe it's there the whole time. I don't know. But the first time I right-click, I have an opportunity to essentially move it, and then it stays moved. It doesn't like go away and get, get like deleted from the DOM and then reinserted. So all I had to do was just move it to a different position, and then whenever you right-click and the Shadow DOM shows the menu, it's it's fixed, basically. So let's check it let's check it out, eh? I'm joking. Canadians don't really say that typically. You can ask me any Canadian questions too. I'm Canadian, so I'm sure that's probably why you came on here originally was hey, this guy's Canadian. We could ask him Canadian questions. So yeah, you can. Feel free. Let's check. What was the change again? Right, so yeah, I just, instead of, I find the shadow root, it's the related target, and then I was getting the, what was I doing? I was checking if this was already appended. Ah, oh, sorry, I got a sneeze that's just like, fighting to come out. Oh, an unfulfilled sneeze, those, those are the worst. That's gonna haunt me today. Wish I could have done it, oh well. Gone, say la vie. So now I call it rel relocate shadow root, and I changed it here. Now what I noticed, what I think happened, is at some point when I needed a styled element, I just copied like this line because I realized I actually have this in a different place in the styled photo. I had it, and this was causing a build error. I didn't notice. I must have copied this because this absolutely was not supposed to happen for the photo. The photo app would not have found a shadow root, as far as I know. Would it? No, the shadow root wouldn't have been that name anyways, right? What was the name? Yeah, shadow root host. That was very much a Monaco thing. So I don't see why it would have ever been here. It should not have been there. That's just something I found out because of the fact that I renamed it and then it caused a build error. But let's get to that now rather than three commits or whatever when I fix it. 
Oh, we should probably demo it. I already committed it, but let's demo it anyways. Now when I right click, oh, now when I right click, oh, I gotta reload Monaco. <sighs> Open Monaco and right click. There we go. So it's outside of its bounds now and it's free bird. It still works. I can right click and say cut. So it still does its thing. Noise. I'm gonna clear some of this patch junk. We just did that. That was this. What next? Don't convert SVG if stopped animate. What was this about? Uh, this was causing some error somehow, but how? For peak, right. If you open up the peak window and I close it from this X down here, it was causing an error, although it didn't this time. Let's see if we can create it. I think it creates better when there's something animated. Let's try it with Doom here. So we got animated stuff going on. I press close. Yeah, there we go. That starts a whole thing where it's like, oh, I want to render something. I'm not, don't kill me. But if I stop it from starting in the first place, I already had the same logic internally when it would start the command. But why would it keep running then, I wonder, actually? I'm not sure how it was getting in those loops, but this should fix it. I needed to check at the start of the function and also on a callback. Whereas I was only checking in the callback. But I need to stop initializing the whole function. Oh, I think I remember the reasoning behind it too. I think here I thought, okay, I only care here so that callback isn't called and it doesn't give a react error. But what was happening is if I didn't stop it here, the HTML to image would call this to SVG and the SVG would try to resize the width of the canvas, but the canvas was gone and that was causing the error. And I, I still don't know why it was looping, uh, but I think this fixes it anyways. Let's double check. Let's try to cause that again. And in a perfect world, we won't be able to make it happen again because I've applied the patch and my code never fails, as everyone knows. Joke. Joke. My code fails all the time. So we peek here, but then you fix it, right? Close. There we go. I mean, that's as much of a test as anything. Although last time it, it didn't didn't fail the first time in my first test, so you could argue that I, I haven't tested it enough, but I'm just gonna say that I probably fixed it because last time I tested it more. This should never have been here as far as I know. I think that's the thing I fixed. Yeah, that never made sense there. I, I fixed that and I just said about that. Package updates, I think we'll do those today. Actually, we're pretty far for only being an hour. Boxed wine's gonna take up some time. Better clean up and, and let's do this one here. Oh, for pan zoom. Yes, this was causing some issues. Is there two pan zoom fixes? Safer process access. Is that about pan zoom? No. Okay. So this pan zoom fix here was basically if the photo app was maximized and I tried to close the photo app, the photo app has <clears throat> a title bar update when it's zooming. So let's say, let's zoom in on my eye here. So if you see here, if I zoom in, it's the same size, but if you see in the title bar here, when I zoom, there's a zoom percentage. But if I close this, you see that it crashes. Basically it's the zooming, it starts zooming down, but it's closing at the same time. So when it tries to update the title, it basically crashes because it's not there to update it anymore. At least not in the way that it needs it to be. Uh, did I download this patch yet? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. So let's apply this patch and see what I mean by better handling. Or see if I'm all talk. What do we got here? Pan zoom, pan zoom. So I added the closing flag, which I already have as existing one. And yeah, now when I go to update the title, I make sure that it's not closing first. And I... This is also just a partially unrelated little cleanup. I was already doing cleanup of the image element listener, but I wasn't cleaning up this other listener for some reason. I think I should have. So I had to clean up both these listeners. And at the same time, that closing thing. So yeah, just better cleanup and closing handling. That was the big thing. Don't update the title if it's closing. <clears throat> it doesn't matter anymore, basically. What was this? Safer process access? Sure. I think that this is like 
most of the time not necessary and i think this was a consequence of bad code but at the same time i think it's like better safe than sorry it doesn't hurt to have it like that because in th in theory i guess i mean <clears throat> best case scenario this would never be undefined and get called but if it can be this is a way to make it safer so let's just do that because now if it were called and it's got that question mark there and it's not defined nothing happens <laughs> No harm, no foul. Here's a PDF thing we can fix. Let me try to find a PDF I can show people. There's nothing too wonky. Um, what is this? Sure, my resume, whatever. Here's my resume PDF. And if we zoom in... Oh, no, I zoomed in on the page, not on the PDF. There we go. We zoom in on the PDF. You'll see that the left side of the scroll bar is... I can't go any further. Ugh. Uh, I can't get to the part of the image I need to see. Also, it's completely cut off on the corners here, so you can't tell is like, is that the end of the page or what? It just is white. And same here, I can't see. I'm not at the end of the page, but if I were, I probably wouldn't be able to see it. So let us fix that. I once again need to download a patch. Need to talk to a guy about a patch. And to copy the text. And I was actually pretty happy to fix this one because the last time that I released my window code or my my version one of this, basically, which was completely different code. I've totally rewritten it. It was a year ago, more than a year ago now. But I had a PDF version app on there and it was it had a lot of inadequacies, let's say. And I'm happy to be able to try to redeem myself with a better PDF app this time. So I switched from flex to block with just text align. Because the list already was doing fine by itself. And I adjusted the margins here so there's no bottom margin. Because the bottom margin is being controlled by the, the last canvas element having a box shadow. And four margin basically matched five box shadow. There was almost like a one pixel where it was like... It almost like didn't account for or something. I don't know. But this just looked better to me. So let's just take a peek at it now and see what it looks like. So now when I open it here and I zoom in. You see it stays on the side. And I can go all the way to the sides and I can see the sides all the way to the end. So that's that's a little more clean, I think. And you can zoom back out and then it goes back to being in the middle. And there you go. We got a PDF app that we could... Uh, I mean, anybody could use this. So if you just had a PDF and you didn't have Adobe Reader, you could just drag a PDF onto my, my website and check it out. And if people want other features, I could add other features. Because uh, actually there's room to grow on that app. So I'm fixing scroll left for PDFs, I should say. There we go. And I think that might be enough except the boxed wine. Yeah, we did that, did that. So there's the package upgrades. We'll get to those, to those at the end. Otherwise, what is this? Did I do this? Don't convert SVG. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're there. Wait, what's this support EXE also? What's that? Oh yeah, that's boxed wine too. Okay, so let's just get right to the boxed wine stuff and start building this boxed wine one. Build it the hard way. I'm going to refresh this. This is the way I used to do all the apps or all the code, so it's not that harder, that much harder. First thing first, let's make that folder. So we're making the boxed wine app now based on the builds that I was given by the generous people. Uh, let's push these 25 commits we did before this in case I somehow nuke the whole repo with my sheer incompetence. And let's make the folder. So it's gonna be called boxed wine, like so. And what are we gonna put in there? So for styling, we got, the only thing I had, this was a nice little fix, is I noticed that with some of the games, this is a cool thing that boxed wine does, is the cursor element. It actually will get the cursor from the app and set the cursor in CSS via like a data PNG of the cursor. But when it has a problem getting the cursor, it'll do cursor none. And then you can't see it at all, which I didn't think was too cool. So in the cursor none scenario, I actually bring back the cursor. That was my little contribution to that. For me, it helped. I don't, I don't know if everyone that uses box wine should do that. I'm not gonna recommend it, but it helped me for now. So that's piece one. That's the styled container. Next up is the config. 
Let's copy this whole config here and let's look at it in VS Code. I'm going to make a file called config.ts. And what have I got in here? So I made a few functions. I made the config params array object. And this was equivalent to the fact that they use URL parameters, but I wanted something that looked a little more cool. So I decided to make an object where the keys are the key value and the, and the value is the value. So inline default on-demand root overlay. What is that saying? That's saying that this file, which is actually a zip file, is essentially the main file system for this Linux wine setup. And it's on-demand allows it to request little bits of the zip file as it needs them. And the on-demand for is uh, root. I don't know what, what it, that's needed. That is needed with this. That's all I can say. I've set the resolution to be a little lower than the default to fit better with my window size. And let me switch what I said, by the way. Um, this is the root with the full file system. I think the on-demand mode is saying that the root can be that on-demand. And the inline basic one, just to boot it up, is the this is the minimum. This is like a smaller version. Oh, sorry about my sniffles, by the way, guys and girls. And Ms. Mars, whoever else. Here's the libs. So we needed... This part's a little weird. I might switch this in the future. Is they actually use browser FS, but I couldn't use my version of browser FS because they use some of the modules that I actually excluded from my version. But that also means that, like, if someone goes to my website and never uses boxed wine, then I don't know if I would want to give them a more bulky version of browser FS just just in case we I want to share it with boxed wine if they happen to run it. So I almost don't mind having a second library here. They seem to interact okay. Same with JS zip, actually. That's another one funny, is that I use JS zip too. Although, do I? No, I guess I don't. I use FF late. Uh, at one point, I use JS zip, but I, use, I have a zipping library. Like, this thing's doing zipping stuff that I, I could also have already done with the zip library that I have. But again, and again, that's also something that's lazy loaded. So it's almost okay that, like, hey, if you open box wine, you get that. And this is all files that come with their build. And then the get config, this essentially just gives me that URL string by doing the, the query params here. Takes the config params plus whatever you pass in, combines them, and then it makes one big URL parameter string, which is what boxed wine accepts. Next up is the container component. This is the generic container component that I, idea that I've created and used uh, quite a few times now. Uh, this should be a TSX file, I think. Yes, this should have been a TSX file. So this is a generic one, but uh, it has the canvas here. That's the one unique element to it. it. has a canvas with an ID of canvas. Here's the hook. This is the meat and potatoes of, of a good chunk of it. As you can see here, it's a little more big. Let's create that one as well. It's called use boxed wine dot ts d no just ts where'd the d come from the new typescript format that i'm making d is for dustin i'm just joking there these have to be exported that's something that's missing let's do that export the zip async and the unzip async was i doing yeah i used both of those okay let's export those I remembered I'd exported those before. So that one's copied. We'll go through these a little bit more. I mean, I already went through the other ones, but the hook I'll go through after we finish copying because the hook is like interconnected with everything. So let's just get everything all set up. We've already did this. A lot of this stuff we've already done and it's not related to boxed wine. I mean, not a lot. Everything that's not boxed wine we've already done. So we can just pretty much ignore it here. But we do have to be careful because there's some stuff here that's like overlapping possibly. I don't think there is, honestly, though. Here we go for the extension. So we now support EXE. Yes. Yes. I'm hyped about that. My website runs at EXE files now. And we also support it the boxed wine running zip files because zip is a format that it supports. And basically the zip is just like you take a folder from your program files, zip it up, and that's the zip. And I've actually added code 
I could have let it go to this like shell that they have and then let the user figure out where to where their exe is and run it. But what I've done is I've added a little bit of logic that basically just finds whatever the biggest exe is within that zip file and that's what it decides to run. It's it's not perfect science, but it's it's actually worked in all my tests. Pretty much every time you want to run a program, the program is the biggest thing, the exe. I mean, there's some DLLs that can be big, but it's not going to run a DLL. It's going to look for exes and run the biggest one. That's the idea of it. Oh, let's just review what I wrote there too. But this is just the extensions list. So the icon is going to be this executable icon that I've, I've got that we'll check out. The process is it can run box wine and then the type is an application. And then for the zip here, I, I just added boxed wine to the possible processes. So when you right click a zip file, you'll have an option to do that. To run it in boxed wine, sorry. Just to clarify what I meant there by that. All right, what next? What next? We've already done all these. We did this. Here we go, the directory. We need to add the boxed wine app to the directory. I, I have a directory of apps that I haven't found any way other than hard coding to work with for now. Element OPQR. It's going to be right at the top. So it's a lazy loaded app. We don't allow resizing at this point, maybe in the future. The default wallpaper is black. The size is, is like I said, in that URL parameter, which is 640 by 480. It's got a boxed wine icon and its title is boxed wine. That's another one down. What else here? Types. I didn't change anything here that I hadn't already updated. This comes from the package update. We'll do package updates. This also is all package update stuff. Not important right now. We did this. Here we go. So here we're getting into some source files that I need. So this one's hard to explain. This one I can't really necessarily tell you line for line what I did. Not because I don't want to, but because I don't remember. I'm going to download it here. It's a, it's a big shell file. I need another folder now. Oh, let me keep the show notes. I lost my show notes here. So now we need to go into the public folder in program files, and I need to make another boxed wine folder for the libs. Boxed wine. And I'm going to open up the libs folder on my explorer here, and I'm going to paste in that first file. So this file is an important file, and I did a lot to this file, but I basically did it through reverse engineering and just just trial and error. So I've I've had to, it's it's hard coded basically. It's hard coded to work for me. So I've hard, I've had to change these URLs. I had to move a bunch of stuff around. It's not it's not easy process. I, I've been working, I worked, I talked to the person I've been working with him, but I, I messaged the person who wrote a lot of this and he basically said, it's just, just to get it going. So it's not like he meant he made this to be some awesome component that's just very interconnected. It's, it's like a proof of concept almost. There's stuff in here. I don't even need the Dropbox stuff. I might clean this up later, but for now it got it working. It's not huge. It's like 48 kilobytes. Not so bad. This isn't like a big deal. This thing there is a few little minor tweaks I had to do to one of the other files too, I think. Let's get to the other source file. So this one here, this is a big one. This one, I think I almost changed nothing, but I might've changed something tiny. I don't know. I probably changed something tiny. Let's copy that one over and take a quick peek at it. So this is a big file anyways. How many lines is this darn thing? Almost 10,000 lines. This is like to get the, the WASM file working, the WebAssembly stuff. And I pretty much changed nothing here, actually. But I think there might be a few places where I had to like globally set something for reference, like window dot. Yeah, here at the top, I like set this to be like a, a function. It was weird the way I had to do it, but I had to find a way to isolate it because it was it was polluting window, first of all, with a ton of stuff. And it was also hard to initialize and to reinitialize. So that was a big part that I had to do was the, the ability to make it run more than once. So this is the WASM file. This is like the meat and potatoes of the logic that, that they've made. This is that browser FS piece. As I was saying that they have their own uh, version of browser FS. Theirs is quite chunky. Looks like theirs is 800 kilobytes. Yeah, mine's nowhere near that size, but whatever. That's the version that works for them. I think they've modified it a little bit too. So that's another thing where I kind of get scared from it. What next? Uh, we just did this one. So here's the 
That's the full file system. I think this is a big file. Yeah, this is 48 megabytes. But this is where I was saying it does the on-demand requesting. So it can get little bits at a time. It doesn't have to get a huge file because the zip file is just a bunch of files. And if you know the start and end of the compressed file, you can take that bit and then decompress that, essentially. Oh, nice. I got my daily spam here. I'm always getting spam from, from some rando. Unwanted spam. Yes, that was unwanted. Okay, what's next? JS zip. That's another lib we need. That's another one that comes from the... It just comes from the builds that they already have provided for me. Quite nicely. This is another... This is the minimal file system that you need just to get started. This, it needs to get the whole thing. So this 9 megabytes, pretty much it needs to grab the whole darn thing. Local echo, we've already updated. Here's the pictures. Let me view these. That's the boxed wine icon. That's the executable icon. And these are bigger sizes of them. Basically, there's two sizes. The 16 pixel one, very tiny. 16 pixel executable. And the, oh, what am I doing here? Did I just save like not a PNG, that last one? Oops. Yeah, you gotta open them. These are the 48s and these are all transparent. Well, yeah, these are all transparent, I guess. I'm going to be completely transparent with you. These are transparent. Here's the shortcut that goes in the start menu where the other apps are. That's it. Was it users? Start menu. Just right in here. New file. Boxed wine.url. There we go. Using the icon with the base URL being the name of the app. We already did this and this as well. Yep, those are the two exports that we just did at the start, and that's it. So with that, I think we have a functioning version of Box Wine, if I'm not mistaken. Although I haven't copied those files I downloaded yet. Let me do that. I need to copy those. There's how many files? There's seven lib files. And I'll just show you now because I've copied them all. These are the, ah, they're not easy to see here. Public, program files, boxed wine. These are the lib files, the shell the main JS file, the WASM file, the BFS, the full file system, JS zip, and the mini, the mini file system. And I also need those icons. Let me just copy those as well. I know where to put those. Those are in system icons, and then I have folders depending on the size. Copy the 16 by 16 ones, and then the 48 ones. I have to rename them because I they named they got renamed slightly there when I saved them. There we go. So there's, I just saved the images. We can take a peek at those. Here's the big executable and the big boxed wine icon for reference. Where are we now? I got a million folders open. I got another person here, Sandra Brooks, also saying Vark Tech. That's weird. So I guess it's like a spammer thing. Oh, it's like dot tech. Like it's like a, like the tech top level domain. Okay, so I guess those are spammers too. That's unfortunate. Do I have anyone real in here? That's come on, guys. Come on. Oh well. Hopefully if anyone real watches this, please throw me a comment. It'll uh, it'll be nice to know it's just not a bunch of spam bots in here. Doesn't have to be in the live chat, but after the fact. I'm not crazy, please. Did I show the executables? Let me show them again. That was the executable uh here, and that's the boxed wine icon. Darn spammers got me distracted. Frustrating. Okay, I think we've copied everything. I think it's time for demo. Uh, actually, before we do demo, I have to build the file system again because I've added some files. So let me do yarn build. Oh, what happened here? Yarn build fs. Rebuild it. And then I'm just going to start up dev again here, like so. Get the dev environment loaded again. And then we can try boxed wine with some like cool demo ideas here that I have. And actually what we can do, even like the more crazy with the demos, let's just try to do so notepad plus plus. People know this, notepad plus plus, right? So let's see here. Download. I want the 32-bit version. Here we go. 32-bit x86. Portable zip. Okay. So it's downloaded here to my browser. I go to my app, 
let me clear. Wait, did this ever load? What happened with the dev environment here? I think it just compiled. It's being slow. Let me try to refresh this. Here we go. Now it's awake again. Let me clear all that. So we're starting fresh. We got the notepad plus plus here from my browser. I can take it, drop it in here. It'll copy. We'll close this. We can open it first as a zip and just see what's inside it. So you see here now we have the notepad plus exe has the icon that I wanted, which is cool as it is. Okay, cool. Let's close the zip file. Now if we right click it and I go open with, I can open it in boxed wine. Let's try it out. So we open it in boxed wine. It does a bunch of gibberish in the console that people mostly won't see. And now Notepad++ is a slow example. I'll show you another app in a, in a short bit that is a little faster to load, but it is loading. And I don't really have any way to do better indicators because there's a lot of stuff that happens inside boxed wine where it's already kind of told me, hey, I got it. And then I kind of just like waiting for it to appear basically. But there we go. I just, op I just downloaded Notepad++ directly from their website and loaded it in the browser here. So now my website is running a copy of Notepad++. There's no servers or anything, any magic involved. And this is the newest version too. This is 8193. That's, that's what I just got, isn't it? Yeah, 8193. So we can actually run 8193 in the browser via Wine. And I could, uh, presumably it could do stuff. Here's, we can open its own documents perhaps. Let's open its license. See if it works. Yeah, there. So now we could actually do Notepad++ stuff. Like maybe I could do one of their advanced searches. Yeah, it looks like it. Some of the graphics are a little bit wonk. But let's say I wanted to do bookmarking. That's something I like to do. Let's say for the word read. Whenever there's a read, mark it. It found six markings. So now I go to search, bookmark, and I say remove unmarked lines. Wait, was that right? Or is it remove mark lines? Did it do it? Is it just that slow? What happened? I would have expected a different result. So what happened? Oh, you know what happened, I bet? Is that my search wasn't set up to mark the lines. Mark. Here we go. Bookmark lines. Now I search for the word. Wait, was it hope? When did I search for hope? Okay, well, there were, there were two hopes anyways. Cool. Oh, yeah, I found hope. So now when I do... What was it before? Bookmark? Where was bookmark again? It's so slow unfortunately. Here we go. Remove unmarked lines. Wait, was that not correct? Unmarked lines. Hmm. Well, it didn't seem to have worked anyways, then. <laughs> I guess it's not perfect. It's still slow. Maybe it's thinking. Who knows? Holy moly. How many lines is this thing? Should it take that long? All right. It didn't do what it, I wanted it to do, but Notepad++ is working. Let's try a few other examples. So let's close this. And let's, uh, I don't think VLC works. What about virtual dub? This is, this is still a thing. I don't even know why this is the one I decided to pick. This is like something that came to my head when I was just like thinking of old stuff. If anyone has any requests for like a execute, uh, exe in a zip, let me show you the heroes example too. Heroes of Might and Magic 2 shareware. So I go to the DOS game archives here. Here's, a, okay, let's let this load here. So you see here we got, the demo, a playable demo of Windows 1. We we get to see these amazing ads. Come on here. Play the demo. A little slow to load. So we got Virtual Dub going at the same time. Let's look. Oh, man, this is so slow to load. Well, long story short, I already have this file. So I need to download this again. Let's do it. Okay, download it really fast anyways. So now let's try. We got Heroes and we got Virtual Dub. Let's try Virtual Dub first. Open with Boxed Wine again. Let's check it out. So it's loading virtual dub, and there we go. Start virtual dub. Okay, and there's a small chance you could actually do some kind of virtual dub thing in here. It'd probably be really slow, but you could. And now let's try Heroes of Might and Magic. So we open with Boxed Wine, and I just downloaded the demo just straight. Like, there's no fancy massaging I did to the code or anything. And, uh, in a perfect world, there we go. We got Heroes of Might and Magic. So I could press New Game, Standard Game, OK. And it'll actually, you see it changed the cursor. It's actually got my the real Heroes of Might and Magic cursor. And I can go to the gold here. It's slow. It's slow. 
my hope is that one, I'm going to put all this software together and then just wait, you know, 10 years from now, I'm hoping computers will be faster with this. Although to be honest, it's not necessarily the computer that's in, tr in trouble this time. It's the emulator. You could have a supercomputer and it could still play this crap if the emulator is giving you one frame per minute just because that's the way it was coded or something. My hope is that it's not that way, but it, my computer is decently fast, so I can tell the emulator is failing a bit here. I think I actually remember a fix here is that if I, is the sound. Oh, it's, it's in a tailspin right now of slow, but if I can get into the menu, come on, let me in the menu. If you can get to the menu and disable the sound, I think I probably should have done that at the start. Let me refresh this and open it again. Open with boxed wine. I think in the, in the main, I think in the first menu, I can disable the sound. But anyways, this will allow you to just play all sorts of rando stuff. And it's a complete sandbox. There's, there's no no mistakes you can make here, basically. This computer's fake. I mean, you could make mistakes if you map a directory, because I have the ability to map directories from your real computer. So you could map a real directory from your computer and, and delete stuff. That would be a mistake. Oh, is it, there we go. Let me disable this sound. Oh, it's so laggy. Okay, the sound off and the effect. I feel like the sound slows it down a lot. Oh, I went all the way around. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I clicked it eight times, so it should stop. One more. There. Okay, so now there's no sound. Let's see if it's a little more performant now. Slightly. Yeah, there we go. Now I could basically click and it actually partially works. Oh, I think it just crashed. Oh yeah, she's done. Well, I mean, it's not for games anyways, but it can do a lot of cool stuff. What was another one that they did? Netsurf. Netsurf is like a browser. And I think like this almost, if I could make, if I could get a proxy working here, I almost could probably play it. Um, so what is this? This is an EXE. This isn't a zip this time, is it? What is this offering me? Is there a zip here? No. I feel like last time I downloaded this without issue. Anyways, you get the idea. I mean, this is going to be a cool little thing. Like, we can just run all sorts of rando stuff. I want to show you with an EXE specifically. What about NurseSoft? NurseSoft is a site I've always liked. They have a lot of cool little gadgets. Let's see this one here. Um, browser history. A lot of these require interacting with Windows. That's one problem. I'm trying to think of a good example. Why didn't I have any good examples? Let me find one here. I must have one. I must have it here, demo. Okay, let me, this was the pinball demo that comes from Boxed Wine. So I'm gonna extract this to my desk, to the desktop. If we open it here. So you see here, it's like a picture, a data file, sound, and then this .exe. So I can just direct dot .click, just click an .exe and it'll launch, double click. And it just launches like it's an EXE. And it'll either work or it won't work. I mean, that's, there you go. So it half worked. I mean, it didn't have data maybe. So I, I think in that way it failed. If I opened the whole zip, I bet it would have been better because then it would have had the data file too. Because when you just pick the EXE, it basically just takes the EXE. So it's like, all right, that's that's the whole program. Let's try the demo. I'm gonna try to launch the whole demo zip with Boxwine and see if it's a little more cooperative. Because I think the demo was like, was their demo. I think I took it from their thing. Yeah, there we go. So it's this is kind of a, uh, this is running the actual demo of Space Cadet versus I have like a, a WebAssembly version of Space Cadet that I could run at the same time over top of that. Oh, wow. I've never seen it do that. That's interesting. I think these both share the generic name of Canvas. I think that might be something I need to fix. Hmm. Okay, that unfortunately didn't work the way I was hoping it would. It would have been a cool inception. I can open one Space Cadet without a problem. This is the WebAssembly version of Space Cadet. Actually, when did this line occur at the bottom? I don't remember that black line before. Hmm, I don't like that. Yeah, maybe that's the way it's supposed to be, but I don't remember that. I, yeah, I don't remember that. Oh, what's that? What can I go up and down and make it move? Hmm. Well, it's good enough. I don't really play this game too much. I used to play it when I was a kid. And now we have the, the other version too. I think this version plays way worse. I think this is, oh, is this because I tried to play it twice? Hmm. Well, I mean, there's things to iron out, you know? This is part one. I think that's, I think we're probably at a happy point where I can commit this now. Oh wait, we didn't even review the code. What am I doing here? 
we reviewed a lot of it, but let's review the one piece we didn't review, which was the hook, and see how the hook works. That's really the only piece we missed. So I made a little custom type here where I, I created my own custom little config thing. The basics of the box wine demo that they give you is it's just some stuff that's meant to work on an isolated page. And I had to find a way to kind of containerize it a little bit. So I kind of had to make a config within window and I had to put this, wrap this in a function. And this get exe name is when you give me a zip file, I look through the zip file to find the biggest one which is, so what do I do here? I, I unzip the thing and then I got the list. And then from the list, I grab the first one after I've filtered out only the EXEs and then sorted where the biggest length is at the top. Then I grab the first entry, assuming there is one, and I return that. So the main boxed wine, where's the gist of it here? Here's its components. So it's got a main function called load emulator and it's got the hook. So the effect that starts things up is what is this doing here oh i think that the scenario here where i check that there's a type of string is because empty string i accept and it loads the generic shell and i'll show you the shell in a second too but otherwise it, it loads the emulator with the url and it also sets the is running back to false that allows me to load new new apps this was something that was missing that i had to find out myself so for what, what does load emulator do it doesn't do a huge amount honestly it doesn't have to do much it gets the app from the URL, either as an exe or a zip. Here's where it checks. So it gets the extension in lowercase, checks if it's an exe. If it's an exe, then it, then it says, okay, that's good enough. Uh, or no, wait, sorry. If it's an exe, ah, uh, yes. If it's an exe, then that name is, is correct to be the thing that will run when it loads. So it's like load that thing's name. Otherwise we get the name from the zip file. Oh, this is repetitive here. I didn't notice this before. I already checked for this. So again, if it's an executable, then the app payload, wait a minute here. Okay, I needed the original app payload, so this still makes sense. So I take the original app payload, which let's say it was an EXE. So then here, if it's executable, okay, then we have to zip it up. So I have I zip it up with only that one EXE inside the zip, and then I make a buffer of that. And the reason for this is that boxed wine only accepts zips. So if I click an EXE, I actually have to behind the scenes zip it up and then give it to box wine as a buffer. And the buffer is using this app payload option that they have. And I have to convert it to base64 string from a buffer. And then the app name is, is the name, either the executable name or the, yeah, either the name of the EXE you gave it or the name of the biggest EXE that I get from the zip file. Then I set the URL params based on that get config command that we've already gone over, where it's got the base config plus whatever you pass in. And what I pass in is the dynamic config, which is this piece here. And it could be empty if there's no URL. And then I load the libraries, which are those four files. I load these four main files. And then once they're loaded, I update the title of the app. And then the boxed wine shell gets loaded and I pass in the function that will run after it's like started, which sets the my app container app to not be loading anymore so that now it shows whatever the screen is. And that's it. That's that's the that's the that's the caboodle and the kitten. So what was I, I wanted to show you the shell part too. Let me do that. I'm gonna refresh this some cash. Let's get started fresh here. So if I just click box, oh, that was slow. Sometimes that happens where if I do a refresh and open it too fast, it's like a little laggy. So if I click boxed wine with no URL, what it does here is it'll load the shell, which is like the base thing. It loads decently fast, I'd say. And there we go. We're in like almost like a fake windows. It even has like a fake run dialogue. It's like another fake windows, you know, the, the layers upon layers of fake windows. This is Wine running in Linux, like a very cut down version of Linux, basically. Just more Inception. So I think without, with that, we're done as far as boxed wine. I'm going to commit it. I'm going to call it part one because I'm missing a lot still. On that note, actually, let's open this link here just to show you what I'm talking about when I say I'm missing stuff and that I'm working with the people. Both those are in quotes, kind of. So I've made another another issue called is it possible to dot 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 and how 
where I kind of said, hey, you know, I'd like I'd like every app to start maximized. I'd like to be able to dynamically resize the thing while it's running. I'd like to be able to put files on it while it's running. I want to know when it shuts down. Like when you click the X on the on the app inside, it just freezes the whole thing. And it's like process complete. But there's no way that I could detect that. I want to detect that. And then I close my external window to be like, all right, you're done with that. Uh, networking is still very preliminary. Like I was able to get this browser to get to the point where I could make a network request. And I saw that the request goes through as a WebSocket request. But at that point, it already failed, basically. It needs to go through with like a proxy WebSocket or something, I think. And then also a cleanup function. Um, this kind of goes back to the detecting of close, I guess. Although this goes to the other side of it, simulating of close. Because if I close it from my container window, my fake my window, then the canvas, the app, doesn't know that I don't want it anymore. So that's almost the cleanup I need. I need the, the cleanup of pressing the X inside the app. If you press the X inside, it seems to do a nice cleanup and the app runs fine. But if someone opens boxed wine and then closes it via my X, it kind of never cleans up properly. So this guy here, Kevo, Kev Oduer, kind of gave some responses. Uh, the main guy, the, or one of the main guys, Denun2 is another guy that knows quite a bit. And he also commented a bit here. But it's ongoing, you know, still work to be done there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call it part one. I'm going to say boxed wine part one. And it's just going to be one of those things that's like, I couldn't, I couldn't resist adding it. It adds so much value, but there's some caveats still, you know, it still needs some ironing and I'll, I'll work on that in the, in the, the days to come. But for now, I think we can commit that. And I think that the final thing we can do is that package upgrade. There's a caveat to package upgrades too like everything. And there's one package that we can't upgrade. So if we do yarn outdated, that's what I typically do to see. And I did this earlier today to see if that everything was okay. And there was an issue, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll say uh, yarn upgrade latest. We'll quickly review before I run this command. So like TypeScript, Next.js, Monaco, Lint staged, all sorts of interesting stuff, things that are actual dependencies. And sometimes the dev dependencies are good updates too, because it's like, okay, maybe there's some new linting rules. Maybe it catches something. So when I do those, I like to rerun lints and stuff. And we can quickly run through those just to see how it goes. I'm gonna make a note here that I'm doing these package upgrades and I'll make a note in the message here, but we're gonna have to revert one of them right off the start. I'm not even gonna waste time trying to mess with this one right now anymore. This one here, Wassim or Wassy, yeah. They've done something big. Like before it was 0 0.12 and now it's 1.0. So they did do a big update. And as far as I can see, it just doesn't friggin' work anymore. I'm sure that they don't have that same experience because I haven't seen anybody else mentioning it, but it doesn't work for me. So I'm just gonna leave that alone. It doesn't even let me import it. And to try to get it to import properly was just such a headache. And this is with version 1.02 because they've done some import export fixes and it's not enough for me at least. But anyways, these other things like FF late, that's for compression, frame or motion for animation, Isomorphic Git for Git, Next.js for, for all sorts of stuff. And then some dev dependencies to do different linting and that kind of thing. Jest and TypeScript, so good stuff. Usually when I do a big upgrade like that, I'll, I'll do a build, I'll do run my lint commands, run test, and then I'll go into dev and just jump around a little bit and see if everything's okay. And then otherwise I kind of walk away. So build failed, but that's because I'm running dev. I've noticed that with Next.js, at some point that started happening. I think it was like Next 11. You just couldn't run dev and build anymore at the same time. Which is like, okay, whatever, that's fair. But I feel like at one point I could run it and it was successful most of the time when it wasn't bugs. So here's where it removed that globals type. I guess it doesn't need that anymore. Works for me. We put this back to be explicitly 0, 0.12.0 0 until they get their shit together, in my opinion. Uh, what else? If this build works, that means that all these types are still correct and I'm still using them in the correct way. Basically, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but it didn't, it, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but nothing new is broken. It, I guess is all you can really infer from that. Anyways, the build's done. I'm going to do build FS again, just for the heck of it. Although actually that runs with build, so it's pointless. What were the other things I was interested in running? I can run a bunch of these at once with this NPM scripts tag. I can do like, I'm going to run lint, I'm going to run prettier, I'm going to run silent, I'm going to run test all at the same time. 
And then you can kind of see them all running here as little tasks. So the test one already passed, the stylent passed, prettier finished, and then ESLint presumably will finish in some kind of successful state, hopefully, unless they snuck in some something that broke it. And then what's left? Sometimes I do export too. I've actually found Next.js export give me an issue with an update, but I think it was it, it hasn't happened in so long that I don't think it's gonna happen again. Yeah, that's it. So they all ran okay. So I'd say the package upgrade was also successful. We can commit that as well. Package upgrades. We hadn't done those in a while, so it doesn't hurt. And with that, I think we're done. Hour 45, one of the shorter ones, but hopefully you guys got some interesting stuff out of it. We got, now we have boxed wine, so now we have like Windows 32-bit support plus DOS support. So we're starting to have some, some Windows stuff anyways. Um, thanks for tuning in. If you like this video, throw me a like. If you like what I'm doing, you want to motivate me, you want to be a positive person, I think you should probably subscribe. It's going to help. It's going to help the world. Uh, that's an exaggeration, of course. But anyways, thanks for tuning in. Uh, feel free to leave some comments. I didn't get anything but spam in the live chat today, but it happens some days. I, I understand. It's getting near the holidays, so I don't expect people to always waste their Saturdays with me necessarily. Not that they're a waste. We're learning. We're having fun. That kind of thing. So, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, I'll see you in the next one. And, and it'll be the last one of the year, I guess. And then... And then we'll see you in the new year for the release party. So we got some cool stuff coming up anyways. But thank you. And uh, got a, a, from Sahil Mangortra. He gave me triple thumbs up. So nice. There's some people. There were some people in here. There were some people. Thank you very much, Sahil. And, and yeah, with that, again, um, let's call it a day. And see you in the next one. Goodbye.